Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket and all stops in between. Thank you all for the listen. My name is Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of SoxProspects.com. I am joined, as always, by my partner in travel, our director of scouting, Ian Cundell. Uh, Ian, we are we are back from spring training, um, a little delayed because real life got in the way on my part, um, although I am now a real boy as far as trial attorneys go. But um, at any rate, we're back focusing on what matters, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about, don't we? Yes, we do. It's uh, been an interesting start to the year for the Red Sox, and the affiliates have also got going and had some Let's good focus performances. On the so, yeah, we'll, we can. I mean, we'll, we'll probably have to talk about the Red Sox given the moves uh, that were made today. But uh, yeah, okay. fair. Been enough. one of those couple weeks. Yeah, we're recording this on Saturday the sixth, and uh, as of right now, the AL standings um, they look a little upside down. Ian, uh, the Red Sox are two and seven. They're in last place. Uh, the Rays, although you, you did call, you called two things. Let's hit this off the top, and then we'll get into just to give everyone the roadmap. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. We've got new rosters, we've got new rankings, and we've got spring training. And we're going to use the former to frame the last two. Um, make sure you check out the rankings at SoxProspects.com. Literally everyone moved, so we can't talk about everyone that moved. But um, literally everyone moved, I think, except for like Michael Chavis at the top. And randomly, Danny Diaz at 14, um, which I think was just a coincidence. But every, other, everyone else moved. So make sure you check them out. Um, but where was I going? Oh, yeah. So at spring training, Ian, you called two things with regard to the Major League Club and with regard to the AL East. Do you want to go ahead and toot, toot uh, the, your, your own horn if you'd like? Uh, well, the first thing I said was that I think we all kind of agreed on this when we were eating dinner one night was that the Red Sox would probably get off to a very slow start because the schedule was just a disaster for them. They don't play well on the West Coast already. Mm -hmm. And just combine that with everyone started spring training late. Their pitchers didn't have their usual number of innings going in because they were managing it. And Mm -hmm. it just had all the makings of a disastrous opening road trip, which is exactly what's come to fruition to no, to no one's surprise, I think. And then the second thing I said was I thought the Rays were going to be really good. And it was a combination of, they have some really good players, guys like Blake Snell, obviously, but also, um, their front office is really smart and they gain every advantage possible and they put their players in a position to succeed. Unlike a lot of teams or unlike in a different way than most teams in the league even try to do with their weird quirks with the openers and the way they use guys and everything and, you know, streaming their lineups, even rotating guys in and out. And it just had all the makings of the Rays being an underrated team as everyone focuses on the Yankees and the Red Sox and kind of, yeah, both things have happened thus far. And, the AL is just going to be a battle all year. Um, anyone, you know, you can't write off the Red Sox now, obviously, but they're going to be in for a dogfight throughout the summer, I have a feeling. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they, they say how hard it is to repeat. They say, you know, it's just funny because the one area of the team that we were all worried about was the bullpen, and the bullpen hasn't been the problem. No, the bullpen's been, like, really good. <laughs> it's given up, like, three runs all year. The problem yeah. is the starting pitching has given up, like, 900. But, I mean, I remember, you know, one of the things we do during spring training is that we, you know, we update our roster projections because we see who's with what team in camp and we've got some intel on who's still around, who's playing, who's injured. But we were look, we spent longer than normal, I feel like, other than like on a last bullpen spot or something on the major league team because it seemed like we were just kind of looking at it. It's like, is David Price really not going to start the year on the on the injured list? Yeah, because it's just weird the way they had the guys like pitching in spring training. Yeah. It was like the last week of spring training and like Nate Evaldi's throwing a backfield game for like four innings. And you're like, well, shouldn't he be throwing like six innings? And it was just weird. Yeah, it was. Well, I get they, they do the thing now where they avoid pitching guys against the AL East. but Right, but it just seemed everyone was like two weeks behind schedule from where they should be, which makes sense because they pitched like a month longer, you right. know, two to four weeks longer than every other team last year. And obviously – with the pitchers especially, the starting pitching, they need time. Yep. But it just wasn't ideal that they came out against the Seattle team that was already had already played a couple games, was really loose, and they have some good players on that team too. And then go to Oakland where I just I don't I have no facts to back this up, but I feel like the Red Sox never play well in Oakland. It's <laughs> it just like it. 
it's just one of those things. And Oakland's really good too. And then to go to an NL park in Arizona where you have to change the defense, you have JD Martinez playing the field, like it's yeah, just you've got to sit one of the four outfielders. Yeah, it's yeah. just the whole thing is just it had the recipe of like I thought it would be like you know, a four and four and seven, five and six road trip. But if they can get to four and seven, I think they'd be ecstatic now. Yes. Yes. Four so, and seven would be a good thing. Just yeah. to not stumble too far into uh, the home opener. Yeah. I mean, the good news is that, I mean, well, it's not good news because we don't like to see people getting hurt, but the Yankees are, have their own issues in a different way. It seems than the Red Sox with everyone hurt. The Orioles are not sustainable. The Blue Jays are trying to tank as, or are not trying to win as they've already traded one of their better players. And the Rays are just the Rays. That's the problem team. And, um, yep. yeah, it's going to be interesting. The good news for the Red Sox though. The other thing is that the NL, the AL central looks like an abomination. So, it seems like the wild cards are going to come out of the West or the East. And so, yeah, they're really only competing with the Texas, Oakland, Seattle, Houston crew. And then the other two that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. The central's an abomination for sure. The um, lineups in that division literally look like triple a lineups. A lot of them, like there are guys that I expect to see when I go to Pawtucket in next week, not in the major leagues for how, most of those teams. How do you think a team anchored by the current Yankees injured list would do in the AL central? <laughs> it could, it, it would mean, not be yeah, that it's not i mean some of the like they would uh, run away with it but they no, could they could they could not they could finish in the middle of the pack because that i i mean i just remember like i i like to think i know a decent amount about baseball and i, I sure was watching so. you're doing I, a baseball I, podcast i was i was watching uh one of the games and there were like two guys that i'd never heard of mm-hmm and I was just like, I have no clue who this person is. And I looked it up and I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know why I would know who that person is. It makes sense now. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it was just the the AL Central is weird. But, I mean, the Red Sox really need to focus on themselves right now. And it seems like they ha- they are – I don't know whether these are the, – I think the Brock will probably get to it now, the transactions they made today because that's probably the most – Well, let's finish our introduction. Just We want to make sure we want to give a shout-out to our, our supporters on patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. If you want to support the podcast and if you want to get access to the exclusive Patreon game updates um, – that's a pl- helicopter going right over my house if you can hear that. <laughs> Apparently the Coast Guard just saved someone. Uh, but if if you want to get exclusive access to the Patreon game updates, we've posted the first few from spring training. Go to patreon.com slash Sox Prospects and pledge your support at at least the $2 per episode level. We record 20 to 25 episodes a year just to give you a rough idea of what that commitment means. Um, and if you commit, you get access to those. We're going to do more during the season as we go to games. Just short 10 to 15 minute updates on what we saw. Um, and we also want to give a shout out to our $5 level supporters. That would be Sox Signatures, Kirby Miller, Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Ernest Shermer, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Wallen, Lendell Martin, Joe Corkery, and our newest one, Browns of Safety School. I will find your real name. I will say that eventually. But well played. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well played. <laughs> Actually, I think I know who it is. I'll tell you off air. Really? Okay. I think. Okay. Yeah. I've got some ideas. But at any rate, yeah. hey, if they're supporting. Let me just say this, though. If people start going too crazy with the names they want me to say in this, we're going to just get rid of it. So I, mean, I will, be a, good sp- it, so, I will yeah. be a good sport about Browns of Safety School, but like nothing profane, nothing inappropriate. I don't know. Browns of Safety School sounds like a fantastic name to me. Is because don't you can't you buy your way into Brown by like paying the fencing? No, coach or no, actually, Brown has been, has not had that happen. Had anything come out yet? Although I've got a buddy who works there because it's a, because it's a safety school. They only care about getting into Harvard and places like that. No one is going to pay to go to Brown. <laughs> Chris's face right now is great. <laughs> you set I, yourself up for that I one, did. Claude. I did. I did. <laughs> Yeah, I'm impressed. Right. That was very good. <laughs> and of course, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We've got one today. Ian, make sure I get to it. Uh, but we want to talk about what you all want to hear about. Uh, but let's, yeah, let's get right into it. I guess we should start in Boston, Ian. Nothing really surprising there. I guess I was a little surprised that Eduardo Nunez is getting more run at second base than Brock Holt. I don't know if you have been as well, but at any rate, um, 
the opening roster worked out pretty much like you could see coming with no one getting signed uh, with Pedroia starting on the injured list. Uh, Colton Brewer made the team as kind of the eighth, not kind of, as the eighth reliever. Although he's getting leaned on pretty heavily. Yeah, I wouldn't call him the eighth reliever anymore. It seems I mean, like he's he's already got getting more leverage than Workman and Hembry are. So. And Thorn, I mean, what is Thornberg oh, even? Thornberg's like the mop-up guy, it seems. Like, why is Tyler Thornberg on this roster making 1.7 or whatever he's making? Is, yeah. is kind of my question. I get that you're, it's a hedge bet, but, like, yeah. this can't be another... I mean, he hasn't been terrible this year. This can't be another Blake Swihart. I guess that's true, but it's just... You mean starting catcher Blake Swihart? I mean, at this point, he should be. <laughs> yeah, but... uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway. Yeah, anyway. so the Red Sox made two moves today. They were... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Brian Johnson with left left elbow inflammation headed to the injured list. Brock Holt with a scratched uh, right cornea. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun. Doesn't sound pleasant heading to the injured list. Zue Lin coming up. Um, Marcus Walden coming up. Last year's darling of, of spring training who never really got any run in the majors or got some but not a whole lot. Uh, coming up as well can give them some length out of the bullpen I think is the reason you pick him over a Bobby Pointer. Well, especially because Johnson, who was supposed to start on Sunday through yesterday, so I mean, oh, I know. So does assume, that mean Walden's going to start tomorrow? No, I would assume Velasquez starts, but they okay. probably wanted another long they guy. Another long guy that makes yeah. sense, and, and I mean Chandler Shepard, I guess, could have come up, but you've got him on, in the rotation. I think he in. pitched already, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he must have. He would have pitched last night. I think he pitched last night. No, they got rained out last night, so oh, he actually, so he he could have lined up today, have. but. But I think, yeah, they probably I, – I, I think Walden is kind of like their fungible he's the, 40th guy on the roster. He's the rubber come. arm. Yeah, exactly. That's what he was in Pawtucket two years ago. Um, that's what he would have been last year had he not had some injury issues, which is kind of ironic. Um, yeah. But it, it's – yeah, I mean, he's he's that guy for them. And he's actually the 37th guy on the roster because they have three. Right, don't they have two open spots or three or something? They have three. <laughs> they have three open spots in the 40, which is kind of why – Old friend Ben Taylor got DFA'd by the Indians, and I thought that they should put a claim in because why not? He's got an option, and you've got three spots in the 40-man. I mean, I guess the only thing would be, like, the Pawtucket bullpen you could argue is full, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I guess if you like everyone there better, but... That's the only thing I could I say. I that's true. It, it's just, yeah, they got a... They're in a weird place right now. I mean, Lynn, I, I don't think he's going to start, but I kind of no, would be I'm, interested in seeing him get a little run at second too. base. Me too. But, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a solid backup, and he's someone who, I mean, if they ever wanted to go cheaper at the Brock Holt position, I could see taking over that position in the future, like sometime next year maybe, because I think Holt is going to make like $4 million in arbitration next year, whereas Lynn would obviously be on a minimum salary. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, Nunez, sorry. No, 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 I was just going to say that's just – but, you know, for this year, it seems like Lynn is going to be that utility, you know, up and down infielder. Mm-hmm. Well, he's the only guy on the roster actually who can play shortstop in the minors, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Nunez is hitting 167, 167, 208, 4 for 24 in nine games. Holt is hitting 1 for 16. Yeah, that's why I mean, and we saw Lynn in spring training. He raked, and yeah, ever since his – Ever since his first swing change, he's just all he's done is hit. So Get him some run, man. I mean, that's yeah. that's where I'm coming from. Get him some run. But meanwhile, Brock Holt is six for twelve, and Christian Vasquez is four for twenty one. So no, you mean Blake Blake Swihart, not Brock Holt? Oh, I, I meant Blake Swihart. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think the catcher we saw it already. Like Swihart caught Porcello yesterday, yeah. and he caught Evaldi the game before. Like. With the way that their bats are not performing up to standard for the yeah. most part, except for like JD, um, okay. Mookie's yeah, pretty well. yeah, they might have no choice really because I mean we know Vasquez is a good defender and the pitchers like throwing to him, but he can't hit really at all. Like he'll hit yeah. like two twenty probably this year. Yeah, he's at one ninety right play. now with some pop though. Right. So it's like Swihart, at least we saw in that Oakland game when he kind of like single handedly swung the momentum with that home run. And yeah. 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 But I mean, we don't want to belabor the point too much in the majors, but I'm um, looking quickly there. I mean, it was pretty basic how that all shook out. Um, yeah. Let's move down to Pawtucket, Ian. Uh, kind of a very, I would call it a very taxi squad Pawtucket roster. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's weird. It's guys on the forty man who are prospects, and then a bunch of like really orgy. Not players. even orgy, but I mean they've got a lot of minor league free agents. I mean the rotation 
Um, the rotation is headed up by Mike Schwarin, uh, followed by Chandler Shepard, and then three minor league free agents and Josh A. Smith. I guess it's just Josh Smith now. Uh, Ryan Weber and Erasmo Ramirez. The bullpen's got four 40-man guys in, or I guess did. One of them was Walden, who just got called up. Uh, but Lakin's Pointer, Taylor, Walden, all on the 40-man. And then the other four are Henry Mejia, Domingo Tapia, Trevor Kelly, and Dan Runzler. Uh, Kelly's not a minor league free agent, but he's a right-hand sidearm guy, right? Yeah, um, he's an or guy. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got Mejia. Well, Kelly, interestingly enough, from Rhode Island, too, so that's kind of cool. I really didn't know yeah. that. Uh, but Tapia, Runzler, Runzler, your standard sort of minor league free agents, and Mejia, sort of the minor league free agent reclamation project. Yeah, he's like a minor league free agent with upside. Yeah. Because yeah. he obviously has pitched in the big leagues for a while before he got suspended for forever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. And then, you know, the lineup, again, it's a lot of those same kind of guys. I mean, you've, Sandy Leon, I guess, is the other kind of transaction news, clearing waivers and accepting an assignment to Pawtucket. So as not say, to lose his his, uh, his salary. That was really good for the Red Sox. That was smooth. That was because really good. The way they did it was very smart. They waited till after rosters were set, so people didn't want to, you know, mm-hmm. upset the apple after having told the guy he made the club or anything, and then snuck him through to Pawtucket where he's nice. They they just didn't have a lot of depth. I mean, they don't have any catcher catching prospects in the system who of note who are close to the big leagues and. Right. Right. You know, you were looking at Juan Centeno as the backup or as the third catcher who hit a robust 162 in the major leagues last year. Right. So, you know, they didn't have a lot of options there. So getting Leon through was really good. Yeah. And the way that worked really quickly for folks is that Leon has between three and five years of um, of major league service time. In fact, I think he's what was it, 23 days short. I think I counted Ian. He's 23 days short of being at five years. So he can elect free agency, but he cannot refuse the assignment. So what that means is that if he gets if he clears waivers and is outrighted, he can elect to become a free agent. But what that means is he is essentially giving up his contract. Um, so he'd be punting on his salary, which um, I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, Ian. Uh, it's not on our forty man page. It's anymore, like four sixty five or something. No, it? it's not that much. Leon's salary. Yeah, I thought he's it was not like making four, four million. No, four hundred sixty five thousand. I thought. No, he's making over a million, dude. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought he was at the minimum. I don't know. I don't care about the salaries. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, All but I- well, it matters for the CBT. But at any rate, yeah, and he still does care. count against the CBT. He was going to count against the CBT anyways. But he can elect free agency, but he can't refuse the assignment, which essentially would mean that the Red Sox would have been forced to cut him, which his would mean that he then keeps his money. His salary is two point four seven million. Right. Yeah. 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 I knew yeah. it was. You're not. Was, you're not getting. I didn't realize that. You're not getting rid of that if you're him. Right. Yeah. And apparently he's got like he has one kid with another on the way. Like, who knows what he would have made? I mean, Mal- Martin Maldonado, who's basically a rich man's version of Sandy Leone, got more or less what Leone is. And making he got like right one point eight or two million or something. Yeah, he got like two as a yeah. as a free agent. So Leone's probably going to get. Uh, cut his pay in half by electing free agency. Yeah, so makes sense. And he knows that he's an injury. He's a, he's one long term injury away to Vasquez or Swihart from coming back up. Yeah, I mean I he's mean, not out of their plans. He's probably like the best insurance catcher in baseball. I would say of third catchers. Mm, maybe we. I'd have to look at it, but I mean, I mean, like teams are carrying three catchers right now. Like the Diamondbacks are carrying three catchers. Yeah, it's like, but Jeff Mathis is basically Sandy Leon. So right. Right. Fair yeah. Enough. Anyway, but I uh, think, but yeah, in Pawtucket, realistically, I, I'm like moving on to what we saw. Yeah. I think the thing of note to me, I don't know if you agree, is how they use Michael Chavis. That to me is the biggest story yeah. of this roster. It's mm-hmm. not close. And he's really the, he's the only top level. I mean, I guess him and Schwarin are the Schwar- only. Schwarin's solid. They're the only he, top twenty guys on this roster. I think right now, that, especially now that Lynn has graduated. Yeah. Correct. Oh no, Lakins. Think, Lakins. No, Lakins, oh, Lakins fell out. But that's yeah. right. Lakins fell out. That's another thing we can talk about. Which we about. can talk we'll talk about him in spring training in a minute. But I think like Chavis. talking about like Chavis. We were down there four days. He did not play third base once. He has not played third base in the game they've played thus. I don't think he's playing third base again. Yeah, I'm just gonna go I'm gonna I'm well, gonna go there. I, I wanna see what happens when he's sharing a roster with Sam Travis and Josh Ockamy, which is gonna happen probably today because now that you've got two guys going up, that creates the spot that Sam Travis 
will occupy will fill in too because he was optioned a couple days ago, and when he reports, he'll take one of those roster spots. Right, but I, I guess just, you could play Tra- Travis and left in DH, but or you just play Shavis at second. I think he's going to get a lot of run at second base. Right. I just I'm I'm just I'm interested to see how they use him at third because the fact that he's not a very good third baseman already, mm-hmm. he needs reps there. But we were down there for five days, or I was down there for five days, and I didn't see him take a single ground ball at third base. He played first base and second base only, and in the games he only played first and second. On opening and, night for Pawtucket, Tony Renda started at third, and he's not yeah. even a natural third base. And Chavis played first base, and Alchemy DH'd. Like, mm-hmm. it just seems to me that they don't, yeah, third base isn't really in the cards anymore. I mean, and obviously, it could be proven wrong. He could play third base today. I don't know. They have a doubleheader. I haven't seen, seen the rosters out because I don't, I'm not going on the MILB app because it's a disaster. <laughs> it's so but, bad. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I refuse to go on it. It's, the worst thing they've ever. I don't know what they were thinking. The, the, but anyway, dude, the amount of just really quick. I tweeted about that. I got more responses to that than any tweet I've done in the past week. Oh, I've had like people out of nowhere just text me and be like, "Hey, have you seen the MLB app? Yeah, it sucks." Um, Chavis is starting at third in the first game today. Well, we're cutting this part then. Um, the Josh, <laughs> o- well, but it's interesting. Josh Ockamy at first, Sam Travis and left. Bryce Brent's DHing. Tony Renda at second. Mike Miller at short. That makes sense. All right, so that is that is interesting. So that, I think I think it's you'll you'll see move know. around between all three spots though. I think that's yeah. clear. I don't know. They want what him do to I become know? well, but they want. But the, here's the thing: is you've got Devers in Boston, you've got Dahlbeck coming up behind. They didn't move any of these guys. This is how you start breaking up that log jam. He'll get time yeah. at third, especially when you're looking at a, D, a double header situation. Well, in terms of trade value, too, he he's. If he can play third, it raises it. So. Yeah, and tra- Chad De La Guerra started the season on the injured list. He got a fair amount of run at third base while we were down there, right, Ian? So, uh, you know, Chad De La Guerra, when he gets healthy, I could see him coming back and taking a lot of the third base reps. You've got Nick Lavulo as kind of the backup. The mid, the kind of infield, second, third, short, is very thin right now. And Pawtucket, especially with Lynn going up. Yeah, with Lynn going up, they don't really have like actually a the only way you stop. get out of yeah the only way you get out of playing Shavis at second or third right now is by starting Nick Lavulo, who is you know a depth guy. Well, that's why I'm wondering if Lynn didn't go up, who if the, if right. he's not playing third because I wonder because with Lynn up that kind of screws up the middle infield. You, you, you have to move Renda. You have to play, play Renda and Miller in the middle. So yeah. yeah. Well, no, you could have played Shavis at second and I guess third, so, but. But I mean, I'm not. Maybe they're not ready to put him at second base in a game yet, like in a regular season game yet. So we'll yeah. see. All right, but anyway, yeah. I mean, that roster is otherwise. I mean, you've got old friend Bryce Brents, minor league free, a minor league free agent. Another one in Gorkis Hernandez, um, Cole Sturgeon, and Rusne Castillo, who didn't. Rusne didn't even start on opening day, which was kind of interesting to me. Uh, I mean, he's mm-hmm. got an opt out next year. I wonder at what point they're. Just he's not taking it. He's no. Why would he? Yeah. Why would he? I, I, there, I got in a long Twitter argument with someone who thought they were basically holding him prisoner. And I'm like, yeah, they're holding him prisoner and paying him seven figures. I'm sure he could ask for his release, and and I don't know. It's, yeah. Or he could have he could have elected free agency when they outrighted him, and he didn't. Yeah. So, it's 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 not a great situation for yeah. any parties involved. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean that roster, not a lot happening there. I guess the other person you want we should mention is Travis Lakins. Well, should should we first mention Schwarin because he threw on opening night oh, and sure. you saw and you saw him the last day of camp. So I did not see much of him the last day. In camp. Oh, I didn't see him either. Um, so. I was bouncing but, back and forth. Uh, he was but, cutter heavy, I think, was what James said. Jim Dunn was down there with us. It's a slider. It's a slider. It's a slider. Yeah, he was yeah. slider heavy. He was working on a on a pitch. But like I said, I didn't see very much. Of okay, him never mind. Game. I thought I thought you'd watch that because no. I was off doing something else during that game. Um, but yeah, he threw five and a third on opening night, four hits, three earned runs, seven Ks, one walk. Very Mike Schwarren esque line. Um, <laughs> right. He's going to be like a solid, I think, up and down guy. Um, Not on the forty yet, but they've got room. I think he's someone who we could see in the big leagues at some point this year. Yeah. There are a couple guys in that rotation. We do know that Ryan Weber and Erasmo Ramirez have opt-outs during the season, as does Tony Renda. So don't be – I mean, you know, Weber and Erasmo, they're going to have to earn their way up, but those guys could also work their way into being on that uh, on that list as well. Yeah. I mean, and as you said, they have three open 40-man spots. So Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about Travis Lakens, Ian. 
Um, yeah, he was someone who fell in the rankings. I don't know if you can bring up where he started to where he ended up, Yeah, but he was someone I saw the first day in camp, I want to say, or second day in camp. Something like that. Um, and in the AAA game and his stuff just generally was down all the way around. And it was just a little, I mean, I don't like to read too much into spring training velocities and he's someone obviously I'm going to hopefully see pretty early into the season, but just didn't look as crisp as I had seen in the past. Um, the velo was down like 88, 89, whereas I've seen him, you know, 92, 94 in the past. The cutter was like in the mid eighties. It just, everything was down to full grade, which I didn't like to see. And he got hit really hard. Uh, the Orioles team just, yeah, they hit a lot of hard contact off him. He just couldn't keep it down in the zone. And like, I like him as a reliever. I'm just not sure there's a lot of ceiling there. I think he's more like a sixth inning guy, maybe a seventh inning guy at best. I just don't really see a late inning arm. And so that was kind of why he fell in the rankings for me. Um, I kind of, reevaluated how I look at those type of relievers. And unless you're someone I think can pitch in the late innings, then I'm not just sure how valuable you are. Like we've seen it with a lot of trades this off season, you know, you can get a reliever sixth inning. I mean, Ben Taylor got DFA would who mm. is, uh, could be a sixth inning guy. Like, yeah, I'm just, those guys just don't seem to have that much value in baseball. And I think that was kind of how I, I like reevaluated was. It seems like those guys are very fungible and, in terms of prospect value, they just don't have that much. Yeah, two things with Lakins, too. Um, conditioning, I heard from multiple people, suboptimal. Yeah, he didn't look great. He didn't look great. Um, the, here's the thing with Lakins, though, that I think is kind of interesting. What do you think of Travis Lakins as an opener? Four pitches? I mean, it seems like something the Rays would do. Maybe he needs to get traded. Well, there. I mean, if Eduardo Rodriguez doesn't get his act straightened out, right? <sighs> Could you see it? Like give give Lakins in there to throw the first inning or two. No, Rodriguez I, I, I just, five. I don't think they would do that. I don't think they've shown any inclination that they would even consider it. I mean, yeah. who was it? Didn't one of their guys in spring training say he would like quit if they gave him an opener? Am I, didn't someone I mean, say that? It was like Porcello or something. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh no, just, no 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 no. You know who it was? It was. Um, some pitcher said that Bumgarner. Oh no, it wasn't a Red Sox. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, wasn't it was like Bumgarner. Who said he'd um, I, like, yeah, he wouldn't pitch. I, I just don't I just don't see them they haven't shown any inclination, as I said, and I just don't I don't think it's something or, they consider at this point. I mean, point. maybe it's a Jalen Beek situation where Lakins is worth more to a team that's gonna use an opener. Well, I think that's that is a d- legitimate question. But I think I still think he could be a valuable piece of the Red Sox. I mean, you look at yeah. the bull, the bullpen guys they have, like the back of that bullpen is I think is pretty fungible. Like it guys are gonna get called up and down. He's someone, if he pitches, if he regains his velo, tightens up to command, and starts pitching well, we could see up, you know, later in the year. But right. I just don't think there's that much of a ceiling. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, the guys with options are Brewer and Velasquez. Um, they clearly really like Brewer. Velasquez, I think they need up until the starting pitchers get their, get their, get stretched out, get their act together in that sense. But, um, yeah, until then, I wouldn't expect to see Lakins at least. Pointer, I could see Pointer. I mean, look, Pointer and Walden, I think, were the last two guys optioned in, right, um, from Major League Camp, the last two relievers before Brewer made the roster. So, you know, I think that says a lot um, about who's next in line. I think it's, it's Pointer and it's Walden. And we saw that today with Walden going up when they needed a guy who could give him length. Um, so yeah, I think that that's really all there is to talk about, uh, in Pawtucket. Um, you know, Akami, I guess I just mentioned, did look good conditioning wise. I mean, he looked, he looked better conditioning wise. So that's worth noting. We'll see if that leads to him. Maybe. I mean, look, he's, he's kind of petered off at the end of every season he's had so far in this system. I mean, he's just got, he's got the same issues though. He can't hit lefties and defense as well. I'm not saying, I'm not saying he's a, he's a top. 10 prospect i'm just saying yeah you know we'll see if that helps him later in the year um mm-hmm. but let's move down to a much more interesting roster ian and i would say the most interesting roster it, it is i think by far honestly the in the portland sea dogs um they just prospects up and down the roster uh starting in the rotation uh anchored by uh, two of the top five i think prospects in the system in our current rankings yep in uh, our number new number two prospect darwins and hernandez and our number five prospect tanner hauck lineup is anchored by our new number four prospect uh bobby dahlbeck and number eight prospect cj chatham bullpen anchored by number nine prospect durbin feltman 
uh, it's going to be an interesting team to see. I know I'm going to make an appointment viewing when they're in Bowie uh, to go see them. Probably much yeah. to my wife's chagrin. But, I mean, just starting the rotation, you've got how Hernandez, Denny Reyes is interesting as well. Mm-hmm. Kyle Hart for He put 11 reason. strikeouts on opening day. Yeah, got the opening day start <laughs> and shoved. Uh, and, of course, well, Buddy Dedger. Yeah. Uh, I love Dedger. Big Dedger. Uh, him and yeah. I think the rotation, though, that's probably the, like, the, like, we know what Bobby Dahlbeck is. We kind of know what the bullpen guys are. Like, this rotation is very interesting because you start off with Darwin Hernandez. He made all the noise at Major League Spring Training Camp yeah. to the point where some, I mean, we, you never, you, you were, I will give you credit here. You were very hard on that he's not making the opening day roster, even though they were talking. It seemed like he had a chance. They thought about it, though. They clearly yeah. thought about it. Um, but he, you know, he made a lot of noise at camp, and obviously he's here starting, which is what I was very hopeful that would happen because he needs the reps at starting and he's their best chance at developing a home road starter at any point in the next year with any sort of ceiling. So, um, next like four years. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to be that mean, but yeah. Um, but anyway, so with him and then you got Denny Reyes who I don't understand as a prospect. He throws like 87, 88, but he gets guys out. I saw him. uh, He was throwing. Where's my, uh, as I tell you to have your notes ready, I don't. Of course, but yeah, I mean, I saw him over at the Twins Complex. Well, and you're, while you're doing this, I'll read. He pitched yesterday. He threw six innings, gave up two hits, one run, and four Ks and one walk. Pretty good debut against Double A. I don't know who they were playing, Redding, I think, or someone. Yeah, I think the Phillies. Um, yeah, the fight and Phillies. So yeah, when I saw him, he was sitting 87, topped out at 88. Apparently, talking to someone from the organization, his uh, his velo was down. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. But if, if it was down, it wasn't down by much. Um, pitched backwards off the changeup, um, which was 79 to 81. Um, cutter at 82. Uh, a curveball, anywhere from 69 to 77. Um, got some swings and misses on the on the uh, cutter slider. Um, backdoor curve for a strikeout looking. I mean, he, he knows how to pitch. He knows how to sequence. He knows how to keep hitters off balance. But he's not... Uh, he's definitely not a major league starter. Uh, he's maybe a major league like multi inning reliever, uh, who you could get some length out of, and who could maybe throw the seventh uh, for you, the eighth in a pinch if the matchups are good. Um, but he, he's an interesting arm, and they clearly like him if they added him to the forty. Well, I also think it's noteworthy that he just basically skipped Salem. I mean, he had right. six appearances there last year through thirty two innings, and they were confident enough to bump him to Portland. So I think that says something, right? Too right for sure, for sure. Um, Darwinson think, was up in camp, so we didn't see him. Yeah, we didn't see him. And we, we talked about Darwinson a lot. A lot. Yeah. I think the bigger story to me, and the one I'm watching probably even more closely than Darwinson, is Tanner Houck, the first round pick from 2017. Because, I mean, we, we, we've gone, and I don't, we don't need to go into it again about his 2018 season with the changing mechanics and everything, but he, we saw him. Tweaked mechanics uh, and then re- returning to his old ones, and then he pitched pretty well. And obviously, his overall line isn't great in Salem, but I think his second half splits were much better than the first half, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he was arguably the best pitcher in the system in August. And then he came out of camp, and we saw him. I saw him once, or we saw him once, and he was dominant. And from talking to people, this is how he's been all camp. Um, he's just been going out there and just putting Shut hitters up. away with ease. And you can see when you see it, you can see why um, he's back to his low arm slot and his fastball was sitting 92 to 95, got a couple 96s in there. He's throwing this frisbee like horizontally slider thing that I guess it models after Chris Sale's slider grip at uh, in like the mid 80s, 84 to 86, mostly a couple 82, 83s um, mixed in and hitters just had no chance against it. Uh, he was pitching against the twins who probably saw him a lot and they still had no chance. I think he had five swinging strikes with it in four innings and we saw him throw four perfect innings with six strikeouts overall. So a very impressive outing. And he threw a couple change ups that were decent, but it's it's clear third pitch, like 85 to 87 miles an hour. Um, and I mean, I, I'm just, I'm, it's, he's a fascinating guy because everything screams reliever, mm-hmm. but then at the same time, you know, he held his velo. I mean, it's a granted spring training, but four innings held his velo second time through the order. Didn't bother him. Like, I don't know what to make of him. He's kind of a weird, the two pitch mix is an issue, but if he can improve the change up, who knows? I don't know. He's just a really interesting guy to me and someone I want to watch. Well, there, the second there, start, there. second start of camp too. So it, it, I think it is noteworthy. He was holding his velo through four. Yeah. So I don't know. He's just someone who 
his development could go a lot of ways, but this is a really interesting year for him, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. We didn't see Durbin Feltman and Campion, but let me throw this question out to you. What do you think the odds are that all three of Tanner Houck, Darwin's, and Hernandez and Durbin Feltman are in the Boston rotation, but are sorry, bullpen by the end of the year? If you told me two out of three, I would have said like 75 to 80 percent. Three out of three, I think it could. It's like 50 50. I, I genuinely, I mean, that's I, still high. I said, I said it on the radio. I think there's a chance he's in the big leagues this year. I think Feltman is. Yeah. yeah. I just his stuff is in a bullpen role. His stuff could be filthy. How? Like, yeah. yeah. In a in a bullpen role, he could be. I don't know. Like he's a six five guy who sit ninety five. He, I think he could sit like 95, 97. Mm-hmm. And with that slider, you know, he doesn't need a third pitch then. Just air it out for one inning. Bring like, him in for the heart of the order if it's righty heavy. Right. Like he's just – but I also think you try to develop him as a starter, which is what they're doing. And, you know, they tried tweaking it. It didn't work. They let him go back to his normal stuff. But if he can succeed with this, then you let it go as long as you can because obviously starting pitching is more valuable than relief pitching. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, Darwinson obviously was the darling of camp. Durbin Feldman we didn't see because I think – did he get work in major league games while we were down there? Yeah, he pitched, what happened? he pitched in a major league game. Yeah, we so we didn't see him, unfortunately. The other story in the, in the pitching staff there is, is Zach Schellinger, um, who literally skipped Salem. Yeah. Uh, not not like Ray I, is sort of skipping Salem, but he literally skipped Salem. Well, we kind of – I think we called this over the offseason. We were said like, there was a chance. Yeah, because he's a college a arm. He's already 23. I got yeah, it. he's already 23. And he, he kind of is what he is. You know, it's not going to change. And his stuff was good enough that I thought there was a chance. And I'm, I'm glad they did. I, I like to see them being – I like that they're being aggressive with relievers who are max effort guys. Their stuff's not going to change. Just get them up on the high minors where they belong. Let them work on the command there. And if they continue to excel, you keep promoting them until they're in the big leagues. Right. Makes sense to me as a sound, like, progression strategy. Right. And I mean, the fact that they put him in Portland signals to me they're not closing the door on him getting up this year either, honestly. No, I don't he's think another it... one who, I mean, they have a lot of bullpen depth. That's one thing I think, or that's my biggest takeaway from their upper minors is they have a lot of major league potential arms in the bullpen, not necessarily in the starting rotation, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jordan Weems, another interesting arm there, and I, I feel, I'll go ahead and say that I, I, I understand that he was close to making the Pawtucket roster. Um, probably just a keeping as much depth as possible thing. Um, so he's interesting. And then the lineup, of course, Ian, um, it's that Salem infield from last year of Netzer, Dahlbeck, Chatham. Uh, yeah. That really is the highlight to me. Uh, the rest of it I can probably take or leave. But yeah. um, th- those are the I mean, guys yeah, that interest me. Yeah. Well, in Dahlbeck, I mean, we saw him in spring training a few times. I believe he had two home runs on one of the games we saw. And, and we got video of both of them. Yeah, the videos on uh, our Twitter's. There's also links also linked on the, on the front page. Yeah, I was just about to shout that out. Uh, some hero went through and linked all of our p- Twitter posts about um, each player on their player page, so yeah, you'll I, be able to see it on I the front do, page. I gotta of the do site. more of them too, but yeah. Um, but yeah, Dahlbeck had he looked like Dahlbeck in camp. I mean, the power is massive. Uh, the home run I saw, which I had video of, was to right field where he just flicked like a mid nineties fastball to right field, didn't even think about it. And then the one you saw, I think, was to dead center field off the batter's eye. And his power is legit. The defense is good. It's just the hit tool. It's the same story we've always talked about. And I don't know. I mean, he's played one game, but or he's played two games. Then he's one for eight with four strikeouts. Like that's the issue. So we'll see with him. Um, but I, if he can hit, he's a potential, you know, first division player. So we'll see what happens with that. And then I kind of like Brett Netzer was someone. I think we we rose in the rankings. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but. He just, I don't know. I think he's a good baseball player. I think he can hit. I like the swing. He added a little more loft to his swing, it seemed, and he's someone who I'm interested to get another a good long look at this year. Oh, he went up eight spots in the rankings? You're muted. Sorry, he went up. I'm like signaling to you. Uh, yeah. He went up nine spots to 24. Nine spots, thank you. Yeah. So and then, with, and then Chatham went up one, I want to say, or two? Uh, yeah, he went up one from nine to eight. And he's just he, – I think that was really more – honestly, I think that was more Mata going the yeah, other direction. Yeah, Chatham is so. what he is. We, we know what he is, but – and I, I don't think – obviously with Bogart signed now, he doesn't need to be the long-term answer at shortstop, which is yeah. for the best for all parties involved. Yeah, I mean he's probably getting moved at some point, uh, but you keep him around in case he becomes that utility guy, right? I mean that's, Exactly. 
I mean, you see Rockhold's making what, like $3 million, $4 million a year. You save a lot of money if you can have a minimum salary guy there. Yep, for sure. Um, Yeah, and the thing with with Dahlbeck to me, I mean, I actually got in a debate with somebody the other day who said that Dahlbeck had a good camp in the major league camp. He didn't. He hit like one something and he struck out too much still. Like, he he needs to cut down on the strikeouts because, again, it's not just the fact that he's striking out, it's the fact that he is. The strikeouts are going to turn into low at bat, low batting average at a higher level. So, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Let's see. Anyone else in Portland to talk about Ian? I think we should move on to Salem. Yeah, let's move which, on to Salem, which is which also an be interesting short. roster. Well, yeah. it's also an interesting roster. I mean, starting again in the rotation, it's anchored by Brian Mata, who fell. He was kind of the faller in the top ten. He's down to number ten from I think seven was where we had him. So he's down three spots. It's, the arm action's kind of funky, man. I just don't. I mean, he did debut. You saw a, a new pitch in, in camp in the kind of slider cutter. Yeah, I just, I, I think he's more relievery than the past. The body has kind of impacted well, he, his delivery. Is my he theory? Looked, he looked better. Well, okay, I'll let you. From when I first saw him, like the delivery is pretty clean, I thought, but he's put on probably like 40 pounds since then. I mean, not necessarily a bad way. Like he was really skinny when he signed, Mm -hmm. but he's added a lot of weight and he just, the the delivery is very arm heavy right now. Decent amount of effort. And it just, I just have a lot of reliever concern now, which is why I dropped him. You know, I I do think there's still a chance he could be like a very, like a back end guy, back end starter. Excuse me. Let me clarify that. But I think the percentage chance has decreased significantly than when he was down. You know, when I saw him, what was that, Instructs two years ago, I want to say? Yeah, two years ago. And so when I saw him uh, in Salem game, I want to say? Three years yeah. ago. No, 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 I'm saying, I, uh, was it three years ago? Okay. Yeah. But I'm saying in camp, I saw him in the Salem game. And, I mean, he had he was a mixed bag. He had a couple good innings, a couple bad innings. Fastball was anywhere from 91 to 96 miles an hour. Um, mostly four seams at 93 to 96, two seam was 91 to 93 command was below average, uh, change up 82 to 84. Fine. I mean, he threw a couple of decent ones inconsistent. The slider was pretty good. Um, you know, for something that seemed was a new pitch. Uh, I think he's calling it a slider, even though it looks more like a cutter. It, it was 88. Uh, yeah. I talked to someone from the team and it, it goes back and forth between it's sometimes it gets a cutter at higher velocities. It's yeah. It was like 86 to 90 The 88 to 90 was more cutter ish. The slider 86 was more slidery still throwing the breaking ball too, like long 11 to five curveball, 77 to 80. I just, I mean, he's got, you know, a bunch of pitches, which you, you would think is like kind of a starter's arsenal, but the command, I just, I'm not sure it gets there. And the, the delivery, the effort, yeah, I'm not sure how he holds velocity. He's a wild card to me. He's someone who I don't I don't know what to make of him. Frankly, he, um, I want to see him. You know how he does in the regular season this year, and see him sometime with Salem this year, hopefully, and kind of have a better feel because he's just he's kind of an enigma right now. Um, his development could go a lot of ways. I would say. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested to see how this new pitch develops because you know with the walks last year, one thing that. You know, you wonder how much of that is just no one's chasing, right? So it's, it's you know, I don't know. I, I want to see how that works out. Um, the rest of that rotation, I mean, it's it's a bunch of kind of interesting guys. Cutter Crawford, who we've talked about on here. Um, I think you saw him down there if you want to maybe briefly mention what you saw. Yeah, I did. I don't know. He was the same guy I've seen before, like uh, low 90s fastball. A lot of cutters. Or- a lot of cutters. Um, oh, here it is. I got it. Uh, fastball was up to 94, but mostly 89, 91. Long curveball, 12 to 6. He actually didn't throw that many cutters because I think he was working on his breaking ball. So he threw a few cutters, like 85 to 87. That was his best pitch, but he was leaving it up in the zone. I, I think he's a reliever, but again, I think it's, excuse me, like a sixth, sixth inning profile. Yeah, sounds about right. A couple other interesting guys there, and Jonathan Diaz with an H and Emmanuel De Jesus. Um, Daniel Gonzalez rounds out the rotation there, but honestly, I think he's keeping the spot warm for a guy we'll talk about in a minute in Greenville, uh, who shoved on opening night, uh, bullpen, John Martinez, I saw, and, uh, it was good. Martinez, good. Martinez was back. He's just, he's so inconsistent from outing to outing that while I want to be excited about it, um, I mean, I don't know if I took notes on him or not, but he was sitting, 
you know, in the, what, what did I tell you, 93 to 95 or something with a heavy, heavy nice split, nice slider. Yeah, like 93, 95, he's, I think you said. Yeah, he's a guy who I think makes it to Portland this year if he's consistent. Um, Jake Thompson, I'm very interested to see him as a reliever. I think he should have been in that role last year. I concur. Uh, uh, it's a the fastball splitter combination. Fastball splitter slider I like a lot better in one or two inning role, uh, outings out of the bullpen than as a starter. Yeah, and he was someone I saw in camp. And he was like 90, 91, 93, uh, good splitter, 83, 84, slider, 84, 85, curveball, 79, 80. I think he's going to eliminate the curveball and it'll just be fastball, splitter, slider. And as you said, he's someone who we kind of always pegged in a bullpen role. So I'm interested to see how he takes to it. And speaking of guys who throw hard too, Andrew Politi, uh, a yes. guy who kind of came out of nowhere last year. I think he was a, he was a, uh, a you know, fifteenth rounder last year. Senior sign. Ball. He was a senior. Yeah, he was. A, was he a senior? Yeah. He's twenty two. Okay. He was a senior. Yeah, he's twenty two. That's true. Um, another Seton Hall guy, uh, along with Schellinger, actually. So that's mm-hmm. that's a bullpen that's feeding this t- system right now. Max effort, but he throws hard, man. It was ninety three to ninety five. Um, yeah, it, I've, it was, I've seen him up to like ninety six, ninety seven. I want to say before. But yeah, it's just they're, they're, there's so much effort, a lot of injury risk, yeah, but a he's another guy. There. He's another guy who I think could move pretty quickly, and it's more like I, I'm not. I don't think I think he's more like maybe an up and down emergency relief arm, but he throws yeah. hard. It's nice. But I mean, he, there's a I mean, there's a ceiling there of a major league reliever. Yeah, for sure. I mean, guy, you, the, the bar to be a major league reliever right now is not the highest thing in the world. So yeah. Lineup is uh, in Salem is anchored by Jaron Duran. Duran moved up in our rankings. He's now ranked 13th. Uh, we had had him ranked 16th, so he's up three spots, which, again, doesn't sound like a lot, but there's, you know, as you get closer to the top, not a ton of room to move there. So uh, Duran is fast, Ian. Yeah, he uh, he also shockingly hit a triple on opening day. Oh, wait, <laughs> that's not a surprise at all because he, like, led minor league baseball in triples last year while playing 60 games. Um, he was three for five on opening day. He just hits. I I I, I, don't, I really like him. He's someone who I moved up. He, he's someone who just every time you talk to a scout who sees them, they're always like, yo, have you seen this Duran guy? It's, like, it's pretty interesting. It's like, yeah, where'd they get him? Oh, he was a seventh round pick who signed for $190,000. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse I mean, me? Yeah. Mike Rickard, said said? On the, Mike Rickard said on this that, he, that, that uh, in our podcast that they were surprised at how good he was. And he just, yeah, he's really taken to – he hit, like now that he's out of Long Beach State and talking to some amateur scouts there, their uh, their hitting approach is a little different than what uh, they teach in professional ball. I'll just leave it at that. But um, he's someone who I think the biggest or the most noteworthy thing is he's now playing center field, and yes. which makes sense because he's that good of an athlete that he should be in center field. And if he can play center field with his athleticism, and I think he can hit. I'm not. I don't think there's a lot of power, but that's a definitely potential major leaguer. And yeah, he's by, I think he's the most interesting position player by far. Um, only followed by the, probably the biggest enigma in the system offensively and Pedro Castellanos who the difference between talking to people who just see him work out and take BP <laughs> and the people who see him in games could not be more stark because in BP, he, you would think he's like a 35 home run guy because his power is insane. And it was the same thing when we were down there this spring. It's the same thing when I saw him at instructs last year, it's, his batting practice is absurd. He hits bombs in batting practice, and then he just, for whatever reason in the game, it's a completely different swing, and he just hits like line drive singles. And yeah, so I weird. just don't know. It's he's. I, I need to see him hit for power. That's what I'm waiting for. And I, one, I'm going to give up. This is what's going to happen. We're going to give up on him, and then he's going to <laughs> hit like 25 home runs, and we're going to be like, damn it, we wait, yeah. we didn't wait long enough. So who we knows? Moved, we moved him up again. He moved up from 26 to 22, and honestly, with the way our voting went. Um, from 19 to 22, those guys were separated by two points of voting. Um, we averaged three of our rankings to come up with our aggregate. He easily could have been a top 20 guy in these rankings again. But it's, again, it's because we see these workouts in spring training and it just doesn't carry over. And so as he keeps not hitting home runs, he moves down. It's, I think he is the guy that I get the most questions about from scouts. It's like, what do you, what do you have about Castellanos? I saw his yeah. BP. Like, it's absurd. But then I saw stats and I go, I know. I, yeah. I, I haven't been able to figure it out either. It's, yeah. but anyway, yeah. So he's he's interesting. I mean, it's not a great team, but there's a few interesting guys yeah. that are worth wa- watching. I'll and see then, him when they come to town. 
Right. Like lower down, you got like Marino Campana, who I think he homered already this year, who just huge raw power. But other than that, there's not a lot there. Um, Tanner Nishioka, who I'm kind of interested to see just because I didn't realize it until you pointed out to me how good he was last year. But he was in Greenville as a 23 year old. So he's way behind the developmental curve. I kind of need to see him in the high minors before I get too excited. And uh, there's one more guy I was going to mention. Oh, uh, kind of a sleeper a little bit. Like Ryan Fitzgerald is someone who they seem to like. Yeah. Yeah. They signed him out of Indie Ball last year. He did one of those swing change, you know, launch angle guys. And he had a pretty good year. And he got some run in Major League Camp this year. Um, So I'm interested to see how he hits this year. And if he's someone I could see them actually moving decently aggressively if Chatham gets promoted to Pawtucket, considering he's already 23 and will be 24 this year. So yeah, the interesting yeah. thing, the interesting thing to me about that roster is they've got so many corner infielders. So Nishioka started at second base on opening day, and actually I forgot we have our lineup tool because it's been the off season. Uh, so I don't did they play? No, they got rained out yesterday. That's right. But, like, Nishioka has to play, even though Nishioka spent last year at third base in Greenville, he basically has to play second base because they've got two first base only guys in Castellanos and Downs. And then they've got a first base, third base guy in Garrett Benji. And then they've got a third first base guy in Michael Osinski. That's four guys for the corner infield. Well, Nishioka, though, Ken, like, he played second base the entire oh, time when he signed with Lowell. So he, right. he has played middle. And I think he played shortstop in college, so he just, can play middle. It's just interesting that they've got a roster with four corner infielders. And, like, not corner infielders like Nishioka, who, like, should probably could play third or second. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's they have four corner infield only guys. That's not just the Salem problem, though. They have that up and down the system, which they I think we'll, do, they we'll talk do. about it with. Greenville, where there were certain corner infielders who didn't even make the Greenville roster who maybe could have if they didn't well, have other guys. that's different. There's a log jam. I mean, this is just – its I don't know. It's, it's, it's strange to me because the other thing, too, is we can mention Pedro Castellanos was with Portland until the very end of camp because they basically had him playing up a level. And the thing is usually by that time guys like him are down a level, but they were like – He's staying up until Sam Travis comes down, and then Sam Travis stayed, made the major league roster because Pierce was hurt. And, you know, Pawtucket's got Ockamy Chavis, now Travis. Jansen Witte got pushed down to Portland. They've got Witte, Dahlbeck, I mean, and Tobias, who's a third baseman only now. A lot of corner infielders, not a lot of middle infielders right now. So... Uh, part of that is probably in part because uh, Ever Luis Lozada is hurt and, and back in uh, Fort Myers as well. Uh, injuries really kind of snuck up on them this year. Let's move down finally to Greenville, Ian. Uh, rotation, I don't know if I like it better than Portland's, but it's it's certainly the second most intriguing in the system to me by a long shot. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Alex Scherf repeating the level but apparently shoved last night. Uh, apparently was sitting 95 to 94, 90, 94, 94, 96, 96, touching 97. Yeah. Uh, Hey, you know, well, there's take... a, if you want to like read about the sheriff outing, cause obviously we weren't there and he was someone we did not see in spring training, but heard really good things about, um, I believe on our forum, there's a lot of discussion about his uh, debut with some embedded tweets or posts from people who saw it. So I think Chris is efforting to find those right now, but Scherf is the wild card. He's really interesting. I believe he moved up or yeah, down. Who's that Scherf? He, I think he stayed. I don't know if he moved he, up well, or down. He, he, he at least moved up at some of y'all's rankings. He was 19 entering the year, and he's he's 18 now. Yeah, he moved up, but that he was moved mainly up one. Like, but that was mostly us. I mean, the, his his aggregate ranking number probably changed a lot more because we just didn't see him, did. so it was hard to you know move him that much. But he's someone who I mean, they obviously like. They gave him a big bonus, and he didn't have a great year last year, but he finished really strong down the stretch. I want to say and. He didn't miss a lot of bats in his first outing, but the stuff seems to be there. So uh, it's gonna, I'm hopefully going to be interested to hear the initial reports on him coming out of Greenville. But yeah. as you said, the, the rest of the rotation has some interesting guys. That Ward was a draft pick from last year. I believe we saw him in camp. Uh, huh. Yeah, I think I've got notes. I think you saw him. I did not. Yeah, I think I was were, watching. I was watching the Bella. other field. Yeah. Yes. I was watching. Well, you look for that. I was watching probably the biggest surprise to make that roster, I would say. Um 19-year-old Brian Bellow, 
made the initial roster and he's someone we saw we did not see an instructs last year but we moved up based on reports we got from instructs on him and he had a really good year last year in the dsl slash gcl well one start in the gcl and um yeah he's someone who i'm really interested to see how he handles because he's only 19 years old but the stuff is there i mean he's 93 95 with the fastball slider 84 85 and then a change up same velo range 84 to 86 but he's just i don't know he's loose it's some projection there i like the arm strength just a really interesting developmental guy and the fact that they were willing to push him aggressively to say to greenville excuse me basically bypassing the gcl and lowell in an entirety shows to me that they liked him and yeah i'm interested to see how he handles an aggressive assignment yeah um yeah i've got let's see i've got you watch sure for ward first uh, well, we can do Scherf and then Ward. Okay, so Scherf, um, uh, John Calvagno, who uh, is on our forums a lot, uh, he, he writes for Notes from the he, – he, oh, not writes for. He has a website, notesfromthesally.com. He's on Twitter, at SAL Notes. Um, he, he saw Scherf start last night. He says fastball is 94 to 97 early, um, and then later was 92 to 95. Uh, pitch was fairly straight except for some cut on, on some of them. Uh, mid to upper 80s change flash plus uh, with terrific action. Um, 11 to 5 curve mid to upper 80s. Go check out his site. I don't want to kind of give away give away everything here, but yeah, go check out what he said. Mostly fastballs, then curve and change uh, about the same. So he looked good last night, man. I, I think he's he's going to move up to Salem before too long if he keeps throwing like that. As for Dad Ward. Uh, when we saw him at camp night, I, 88 to 93, but it was like a, a four-seamer at 93 and a two-seamer 88 to 90. Uh, slider was 80, mostly 83 through one at 85, and then the changeup was right around that same velo band at 83 to 84. Looked all right. I mean, I was kind of bouncing back and forth. Yeah, bit. that's that's kind of what I saw last year with yeah. uh, Greenville. And he made his debut, I think, yesterday. Um, had a pretty good debut, five innings, five hits, two earned runs, six strikeouts, one one home run allowed, two walks. So that's a solid start. He's someone I think ultimately ends up in like a swingman bullpen role. But he's a good athlete, and the stuff is it's interesting. Um, I think the other guys just kind of – the whole rotation is somewhat noteworthy. I mean, Yasel Santana is someone we've seen before. He was yeah. an older signee from a, out of uh, the Dominican. Uh, we didn't see him at camp, but you know, he's, I've seen him in the past, and he throws hard. He's got a couple secondaries, so kind of interesting guy. And then Chris McAmer was another draftee from last year, I believe, out of Kentucky, I want to say. Yep. And uh, he's someone I saw – during camp i'm just efforting to find my notes i apologize for the sound in the background and i can't find them and uh oh here it is i got it and he was uh 90 to 92 uh he mixed in a cutter which is a new pitch i did not see that last year when he was with lowell he was just um fastball curveball change up last year whereas this year it was fastball cutter he calls it a slider but i think it's a curveball and splitter um, so that's somewhat of note and, uh, he was fine. I mean, he had a couple, he got hit a little bit in a second inning of work when the outing we saw, but I mean, it, again, spring stats or whatever, I don't really care, but for me, I think he's ultimately a bullpen arm again, shocking. I know I say that a lot, but there's a lot of effort in the delivery. Um, but the stuff's somewhat intriguing and he just kind of rounds out a bullpen where there might not be other than sure like a standout player or excuse me, the rotation, rotation. Yep. there's no standout player, but there's just a bunch of somewhat interest. There's a bunch of interesting guys who, you know, if things develop right, um, could move up, you know, into the top 30, top 20 radar type. Yeah. And then of course the bullpen is anchored by Yohan Ibar. You saw Ibar and Campion? I did. Uh, he was throwing really hard, uh, which he will do shockingly. He was uh, 94 to 97. Slider was 85 to 88. And the slider and the fastball, I mean, there's a lot to work on. The command isn't great. Uh, you know, the delivery's got effort, very straight up vertical. He's got a crossfire. He's going to have a lot of trouble throwing strikes, but he's made a lot of progress, I would say, from when I saw him last year, which is all I really care about when you're talking about a conversion project. And he made his debut last night. I think he had – he walked a couple guys, maybe got an out or two. Well, which, he – actually, uh, someone on, on Twitter, actually a guy who we banned from the forum, but <laughs> who's better on Twitter, um, pulled the, the, the pitch charts, and basically Ibar couldn't buy a call. 
Oh, really? Okay, yeah. that would make... Check that, out yeah. my, my timeline. It's actually kind of ridiculous, assuming this is right, because there were a lot of pitches in the zone that were called balls. So yeah. he was well, actually minor, spotting the fastball well and was dealing with a, a low-A umpire. I would I would say minor league umpires, you never know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Ibar, I mean, he's interesting. He's someone I believe moved up in our rankings, and it's just, you know, it's you know, left-handers who throw in the high 90s don't grow on trees, and he's a great athlete, mm-hmm. loose arm, He's got a lot to work on, but there's definite big league upside there. Yeah, just to mention uh, rankings a little bit. Bello in our season opening rankings moved up from 31 to 21. Ibar moved up from 37 to 26. So those are two big risers in the system right now who we've got our eyes on. Uh, Ian, we haven't even talked about this uh, this lineup in Portland, uh, Greenville, sorry, which doesn't have a lot of star power yet, but could soon. Um, or I shouldn't say that. It's got a lot no, of star I think power it does right have now. Star power now, yeah, because yeah, it's got a former American League MVP and Dustin Pedroia rehabbing down yeah. there. But um, Tristan Costas, who actually, let's be very clear here, his ranking changed from two to three. He did not move down. That was Darwin's uh, Darwin's moving, moving up. up. In yeah. fact, I think we all are higher on Tristan Costas than we were going into spring training. We could talk about him a little bit. Also, there, another guy who I think moved up in all of our estimations was Brandon Howlett. Yeah. Um, those are the kind of the two highlights. Some other interesting guys down there, the Tyler brothers, Esplin and Dearden. Unfortunately, though, Dearden's already hurt. Dearden's he already on the DL or IL. Yeah. Sorry. That's going to yeah. take me so long to get used to. It's, IL. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's it's those are really the highlights to me. A bunch of other interesting guys there, but um, De- Devlin Granberry, Cole Cottom. Yeah, it's it's a good yeah. roster. It's uh, position players, but well, that's what happens I when think, you have a good draft. You get yeah. an interesting low A team, right? I think Costas, Costas, and Hallett are obviously the the two cornerstones, um, as you would say. Literally, I know that's at first the and point. third. Thank you. I'm glad you caught that. I did. I know um, jokes. I get that's jokes. A, that's a safety school education for you. Oh. Um, but anyway, Costas. I, uh, I I saw him a decent amount, and I he's a very unique looking person. Yeah, he's massive. <laughs> like, he's, a, he's an interesting looking human. He's probably he's listed at six four two forty. He's, he's probably smaller. six five yeah. six six. Not that he's six six. He's definitely six five. And there's, but he's got he's long not skinny. Lit. No, he's he's not in bad shape. Like he's fine. He's well proportioned. Is how he I looks in better him. shape than he did in his yes. trucks. Which yes, we we've confirmed that that's the case. And but the thing is, I mean, he's just got a really good swing. I, I know. The the question for me is, and I think people need to know this is, I, I don't think he's going to hit for a lot of power early in his career. And he's one of the guys who I think is going to eventually have to decide. You know, do I want to hit two eighty with? 20 home runs or do I want to hit, you know, 260, 270 with 30 home runs because he's obviously huge well, power is legit. But I wouldn't I wouldn't go with those numbers because in that case you would obviously hit 270 with 30 homers, but I, yeah, I think if he went down to like 250. Yeah, he would have to give up some yeah. average for power. Yeah, it would be more than 10 but, points of batting average. Yeah, yeah, okay, you're right, whatever. But the, it was a, just a, an idea. I know. But uh he's I'm just got clarifying a, for you. He's got a really good swing. He makes a lot of hard contact, goes to all fields more of a line drive approach right now. But I just, we heard from uh, people that within the organization, that he had a really good camp. They were very impressed with how he played. And um, he's someone who I'm looking forward to seeing on the field this year. Cause obviously he only had, you know, two games last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting that they pushed him to Greenville after only the two games last year and didn't give him a month in spring training in extended spring training, which kind of might be the plan for a couple other guys we're going to talk about in a bit. But yeah. the thing with Casas. His swing looks so uncomfortable. Well, he's six. It seven. works for him. I mean, well, he's not he's six. Like, seven. No, I know he's, he's like six, six five. five. Like with those I, and long I get it. Arms, but he like, like crouches. It's like it's so weird. It's the opposite of what you'd expect. And he's like his body type. It's like it doesn't. It can't decide whether it wants to be big or scrawny. So it's just somewhere in between. It's it's it's. But it works for him, and that's the important thing. Well, and in terms of swing, like. Look at Eloy Jimenez's stance. Yeah, yeah. Like, look at, you know, there's a bunch of guys who have weird stances. As long as you end up in a good hitting position, I don't really care how you start, frankly. You know what his swing kind of reminds me of now that I think about it? It's like in Street Fighter, when Ryu and Ken have that uppercut punch. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about with Street no, Fighter? No, not at all. But his swing oh. is, I mean, he looks like Freddie Freeman. It's a, a fighting the game. Swing. But yeah, no, really. 
Street uh, Fighter is a fighting <laughs> game. God, no, I didn't well, know. It could be mission. like an action game where you, it's like a side scroller. And there's two characters who are basically the same guy, and they do this uppercut that's like a really good move. And it he he like he starts crouching and he swing he comes up as he swings to generate the kind of uppercut plane. Yeah. But and, and it's just the bat looks like a twig. It's just you have to see it. Go to go to the front page of the website. We've got all kinds of video. <laughs> Watch it for yourself because I can't do it justice. Yeah. But it works for him, man. And, you know, they love him. Um, scouts I've talked to who've seen him like him a lot. It's, yeah, I'm interested to see how he does in Greenville. Um, mm-hmm. The other guy is obviously Howlett. I, he just, I don't know. I, I just, I like, he's quiet. He's very quiet, it yeah, seems. He's the I, like, I don't, like, you just, he doesn't, he just goes up there and does his job every day at the plate. Um, he's got, he's just really loose and, but he has like he exudes confidence. It would be the best way I described it. Like watching him go up there in the at bats. He he controlled at bats. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's a strike. He knows what isn't. Like he's just. It's a very like professional approach already, which you don't usually see from guys his age. And I don't. You know, I don't. I'm not sure there's any like plus tool per se, but I think it's a bunch of like really good. You know, average to slightly above average tools. And at the end of the day, that that at third base is is the potential to develop into an everyday player. And so that's, you know, the good right. That's what you want to see. And he's someone who they clearly really like. He signed for one hundred eighty five thousand dollars. And now he's starting at third base for Greenville the following year. I mean, that's quite the find. So yeah. interested to see how he handles more advanced pitching because mm-hmm. he show, I mean, he showed it against some better pitching during spring training. I know there was one day specifically. Um, they were facing the twins in Blaine Enloe, who was the twins second round pick in 2017. I want to say third round pick third round. Everybody got like 3 million. Yeah. He got a ton of money basically. And, uh, he was throwing, you know, 95, 97 with a hammer breaking ball. And Howlett was one of the few guys who could go up there. And, um, he was able to actually take a professional at bat. And I think he walked twice. I want to say, so it's just kind of the little things like that, that you notice with him that he knows what he's doing. And, uh, yeah, it's just, I'm. I'm excited. He's another guy I'm excited about this year. Costas, another guy who had a great at bat against Enlo. Yeah, like he an had, 11 pitch line out to left or something, or like an eight pitch line. As out uh, as one prospect told me a few years ago, the greatest spring training at bat result you can ever have is a line out because then you don't have to run the bases. <laughs> you want a quality at bat and a line drive that ends in and out. That's the goal in spring training. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he was doing that on purpose. Uh, Ian, let's also talk about some of the guys that didn't make teams, whether because they're hurt or because they um, just didn't happen to make it. And I guess there's a, there's a group of guys who were in the running to make the Greenville drive but just didn't, and I think that we agree that they could potentially do that. Um, there's the shortstop, Anthony Flores, outfielder Nick Decker, and third baseman Nick Northcutt. Uh, probably, maybe not in that order. I think it's Flores and Decker were on one tier and Northcutt on maybe a notch Below was what I got from watching those guys. How about you? Just talking about them maybe more generally. Yeah, prospect wise, I would agree with that. I think it's Flores, then Decker, then uh, a decent gap, and then Northcutt. But I think uh, Northcutt had a pretty good camp. I mean, we see he homer twice in one of the days we were there. It's just it's kind of the same, you know, this lot of swing and miss. And I think he's more of like the raw high school type with just raw power. That's you know the carrying tool right now. He's got a long way to go. He's got a lot of work to do at the plate with the approach and everything looked in good shape yeah he did um whereas flores he uh he had some good swings um during bp he's got a little bit of pop it's just he's so young still he's only 18 years old you know it makes sense that he didn't make a full season roster frankly and decker i was a little bit of a surprise to me but i'm we argued he was little, about this. Yeah, he was we a had little a big st- argument about this. He was just he was a little stiffer than at the plate than I remembered during uh during last year. Instructs. Instructs, excuse me. And just he looked, I don't know, it seemed like they were working on him was excuse me, working with him on some things at the plate. And I wonder if that's the main reason he was held back because now that Dearden's on the IL, they obviously have a spot in the outfield for him. Mhm. Right. Yeah, I mean, they do, but it, it might just be temporary. That's why Juan Carlos Abreu was the guy who came up, um, I think. And they've also got – I mean, they had five legit outfielders on their roster in, in um, the Tyler brothers, Cole Brandon, Kervin Suarez. Um, and, I mean, Granberg can also play outfield. So, 
I think that's just kind of a come up and fill a roster spot. And Jordan Wren also as well, who's you know an organizational depth guy, but who they'll, they feel comfortable giving some run to in Greenville at least. So makes sense that it was him. A um, couple guys who I think are much more likely to not make Greenville, but to in fact play for Lowell are uh, Danny Diaz and Gilberto Jimenez, two guys who we saw a decent amount of. Ian, do you want to talk about those guys? Uh, yeah, I guess on Diaz, I just the things that I liked, he was in much better shape than when I saw him in Instructs yep. last year. Uh, he's a huge, it's a huge body. He's probably 6'4". In Instructs, I would have said he was 6'4", 250. He's probably, I think he was 6'4", 230 was what I was told now. Okay. And it, he right. just, he's he's athletic for his size, though. Um he moves well. You can see the shortstop instincts over at third base because even though he's a big boy, I still think there's a chance he can stick at third. He just he moves well over there. I like his hands. He's got a good enough arm. So that's good to see. The power is very legit. Um, I saw him hit a home run in one of the kind of an inner squad game to right field. And in BP, he just hit some very long home runs. So the raw power is there, but their approach is not there yet um he played he got a couple of at bats in the i think the salem game one day and like he struck out on three straight pitches and just the swing has length the approach is raw he doesn't really pick up spin at all so a lot of long way to go developmentally and uh lowell should be a good even lowell will be a good test for him because i think it's going to take some time for him to kind of figure it out at the plate yeah and jimenez was a guy hitting switch uh, switch hitter um Swing looked pretty good to me from both sides of the plate, especially yeah, considering the left-hand swing is a year old. Yeah, it was definitely better than when I saw him last year at Instructs, where you could, I mean, you guys, one of you, I can't remember, it was either Mike or you had to ask me which his natural side was, because you couldn't really tell. It wasn't me, because I knew. Um, but yeah, he uh, his swing has definitely improved from the left side. I still like the right-hand swing better. I think that's the one where he'll end up hitting for more power. But um, I mean, that he's still, the athleticism is there, and yeah, it's just... The skill set or the raw tools are there. It's just it needs a lot of polish and a lot of work, and there's a long way to go. And he's someone who I didn't expect to make the team. I mean, he played last year as a 16 year old. Sir, no, he didn't. He played last year as a 17 year old. That's wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it says 16 on his page. Um, but he's got a long way to go developmentally. But if he figures it out, you know, there's significant upside there. Um, last couple arms, I guess, to maybe just to pull out of you, uh, not pull out of you, but to to. Le- lead you um to guys you saw one i don't know did we see miguel suero or were we just high on him based on reports because i know we thought that he might make the greenville roster ian i'm i'm looking my notes okay. well, the other guy that i, I don't you think saw, i don't think we oh no i did see him i did see, okay. him. Yeah, I did see, him. see him and then another guy and a converted catcher in osvaldo de la rosa um yeah a reliever who you really liked so those two guys maybe if you could talk briefly about them yeah, Suero was uh, – he just – I mean, there's not a lot of projection because he's older. I want to say he's like 20 – he's 22. Yeah. Um, but he's another one of the guys they signed late for 10K. But, you know, he's got – his fastball is like low 90s. Um, he's got good feel for a curveball, like 82 to 84 with a lot of vertical movement. And then he's got a straight change up. And I just – I liked his breaking ball. I liked his feel. And he kind of knew what he was doing at the plate. And so he's someone who I just – I think has some not a lot of upside necessarily, but it's just like an interesting arm, I would say. And he, we got, I got some good reports on him from Instructs, which is partially what I was kind of built the basis of that report. And then the other guy um, you mentioned, Osvaldo De La Rosa, someone I'd never heard of uh, before here. Uh, he pitched last year in the DSL, twenty-seven innings, uh, thirty-six strikeouts, so decent numbers in the DSL last year. He's a very big boy, 6'4", two, uh, 210 listed, signed for $1,000. Um, and, yeah, he was 93 to 95 with a heavy fastball and, like, a short slider at 86 to 87 and then a slower, more vertical breaking ball in the low 80s. And uh, he's someone, it turns out, it was this, they signed a re- or he was a catcher originally. They converted him to pitcher and it seems like he's taken to it. And, obviously, the development, he's still learning how to pitch and everything, but just that kind of arm strength is what you like to see with those, you know, younger, uh, like transition projects, um, from the ma- from the position player to hit pitcher and kind of like in the yo and Ibar mold. He's someone who I wonder if we'll see in the GCL this year with the eye towards maybe a late season call to San- to Lowell. And then, um, next year, you know, jump to Greenville and go from there. Uh, this is De La Rosa. You thought, I mean, I would see he's tw- he's twenty one. Uh, you got to send him right to. 
I would Yohan say Ibar right was, to Lowell. Yohan Ibar was 21 last year. I guess. I guess. That's true. That's true. Like, All right. Yeah, fair I don't, enough. And then I don't, next as year, as it was as as I put him in Greenville next, next year. year. It doesn't matter how he gets there. Fair. Okay. Fair enough. Fine. You're right. You're right. Okay. You're right, Ian. Um, all right. Well, unless you've got anything else, Ian, that you want to mention on rankings or rosters or spring training, let's move on to some emails. Uh, we got a couple of them. Uh, the first one is an email from Bill Stan, and I don't know that there's a question here. Um, he just the, the subject is under 20 Sox minor league lineup, and he lists a lineup um, that has co- so basically it's a lineup of players in the system who are under 20, um, with Casas at first, Cowlett at second. Uh, Flores at short, Danny Diaz at third, Jonathan Diaz catching. I should probably might want to throw in a note about him. I was just about to say, yeah, he's with an outfield one. left to right of Jimenez Lopez, uh, Eduardo Lopez, who we didn't see because he's going to play in the DSL this year. Uh, Nick Decker in right and Nick Northcutt at DH. Um, it's interesting, Ian. This does strike me as kind of some of the best very young talent they've had in the system in the in a while. Uh, just to kind of get a discussion topic out of it. I'm trying to think if there's anyone I would throw in there who's a, uh, and it is still in their teens. That's probably about it. Yeah, I can't think of anyone. Yeah, everyone else is probably. Well, oh, Tyler Esplin's still 19. Yeah, he was. I mean, we should mention him actually briefly, too, because I don't think we touched on yeah, him in Greenville. Yeah, he's but in much better shape than he was Yeah, last he looked year. in good shape. The swing looked good, and he's got pull side power. So he's someone who, now that he's healthy, I wonder, uh, I'm interested to kind of kind of see what happens with him because um he's obviously someone who they gave a, de- a little bit of money to a few years ago and drafted pretty highly so uh yeah he's another one i should have mentioned probably back at the greenville portion mm-hmm. um and then i guess what would your rotation be i guess brian Bello is still 19 for now he turns 20 on may 17th so maybe we'll shoehorn him in um, they don't really have young pitching. Brian Mata is still technically nineteen. He turns no, twenty. Is he in, really? He turns twenty in May. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's part of the but, thing with Mata is he's in Salem as a nineteen-year-old turning twenty. Yeah, beating the level. Aldo Ramirez would be another one. He's not. He's someone we didn't see, unfortunately, when we were down there. I but think he's I got, hurt because he wasn't okay. really participating in. in but yeah, uh, I, got, I, got, I got good reports on him out of uh, the D, out of Instructs last year, and uh-huh. that's pretty much the only noteworthy under 20 arms I can think of. Yeah, Santana's 22. Oh, Cuz a lot of the like Latin guys who have made it up to Greenville Sturge or anywhere 22. they they all signed late for yeah. small pieces, which I really like that strategy for the record, but yeah. Um, ooh, how old is a uh, Jay Groom is 20? Yeah, he turns 21 in August. So yeah, I mean you could you could figure out a, a full lineup with those guys. To let us know, email us if, you, if we're forgetting anyone that you think should be in there. Um, but thanks for the email, Bill. Um, the other email comes to us from Matthew W. Uh, he says, I recently saw an article about the, how the Blue Jays made a large increase. I'll talk about that. In the salaries of their minor league players, we often hear about how difficult the struggles are for minor league players. How do the Red Sox compare to other teams and how they compensate and otherwise take care of their minor leaguers? It seems like it would be a good investment in the, in the long term, making a good impression on players in the early part of their careers. Um, thanks to the email, Matthew. Uh, maybe I'll kind of take the lead on this one, Ian. First of all, I agree with that last statement. I don't know about as far as creating a good impression um, because guys are going to do what they do if they're going to make the majors and if they don't make the majors – I hate to say it, but who cares? Um, the goal is to develop major leaguers, and that's why minor leaguers make what they make and are treated the way they are treated. Um, the Blue Jays apparently did. I think they doubled, Ian. Does that sound right to you, their minor league salaries, or, or gave them a 50% pay raise? The problem is the pay raise is from, like, almost nothing. Um, well, so, some minor leaguers don't make money during the year. They legitimately like they make like net zero, or they, they make you yeah. know like a hundred dollars because you have to pay because there are there are hidden fees that you don't realize. I think from if you're just like so a I average think, fan, I think this comes out of the lawsuit. But here is a sample minor league pay scale: rookie ball players, and this by the way is only for when they're in season. I think. Do they make it an extended? I'm not sure. I know that minor leaguers don't get paid no, during spring training. I don't think so. They oh, don't extended? I don't know. Yeah, they yeah. don't get paid during spring training. They don't get paid during fall instructional league. Correct. They do get paid in the Arizona Fall League. Yeah. Um, but here's here's the pay scale for the vast majority of minor leaguers. 
um, who are not on the 40 man and who are not minor league free agents because um, well, I'll get into that in a minute. Well, let's start there. Minor leaguers on the 40 man get $44,500 in their first year and $89,000 in subsequent years. Years. That's not horrible. Okay. That's not bad. My, my first job out of college, I made 20 grand. Minor league free agents, they negotiate their own deals, and some of the higher end ones can sign for like over 150K. Um, some who are on opt out or tryout type deals might sign somewhere around like major league minimum. So, like, it wouldn't surprise me if Erasmo Ramirez is making well, close like, to the major league minimum. Gio Gonzalez got like $2 million from the Yankees on a minor league deal that if he makes the big right. league club, it like, yeah. Yeah, so. so, you know, others on outright deals will still get their major league pay. So, like, Ruzne Castillo, Sandy Leon are still getting their major league pay. The vast majority of minor leaguers, here's what they make. In rookie ball, $1,150 a month. for six. This is for six months. Low A, $1,300 a month. High A, $1,500 a month. Double A, $1,700 a month. Triple A, $2,150 uh, $2, a month. Again, this is for six months. So for the year, a AAA player making that is making $12,900 a year. A low A player is making $7,800 for the year. They do get a per diem of $25 a day, but that's only when they're on the road. Um, but that, that said, minor leaguers also have to pay clubhouse dues of 7 to $15 per day. Some organizations provide food. Some do not. Some most organizations do not provide living quarters, although you'll, yeah, Firefly the cat is also pissed off. Um, some will let you stay with a host family. Yeah, that's so what I was about to say. The host, host family. families in like Portland, I think. They, I think are there some in Greenville? Maybe I don't know. I don't think there Green, are Greenville. Greenville, they have to do apartments. Greenville, they, they have, have to, to do apartments. Themselves. Salem, I think, does not have. I don't. I don't know Salem. I don't think Salem has host families. Um, Lowell, Lowell, they stay in the dorms. Lowell, they stay in the dorms at U Lowell. Um, at UMass Lowell. Uh, in the Gulf Coast League, they stay at a hotel. There's a team hotel. Um, so they have that. Uh, but like I said, at those other levels, you're paying for your own lodging. I mean, that's why some of these guys stay five to an apartment. Uh, and people say, oh, well, they're, they're playing a kid's game. They get bonuses. Most of these guys don't have bonuses of any, of any size. It's, you know, some of the higher-end draftees do, but, like, a lot of these guys don't have – bonuses that can carry them through four or five minor league years well and i think you especially look at like the latin american guys you know in a given year the guys who make it over only a few of them receive more than ten thousand dollars yep to sign so yeah and, and so that's why when you're increasing like when you're doubling this pay that's still nothing that's still nothing um a story came out recently where major league baseball was in talks with the basically the the organization that runs the affiliated minor leagues about they would do pay increases, but they would expect some of the affiliates to pick up some of the money and to improve their facilities to be certain to reach certain standards. Which, by the way, some of these facilities are dumps. The Red Sox are lucky in that they have good facilities all the way up. Um, oh, I thought you were. I thought that facial expression was for me, but I know what it is. Um, they, they have pretty good facilities all the way up, so they can't really complain. But some of these road games I've been to, guys, I mean, I'll come out and say it. Lynchburg is a dump. Hagerstown is a dump. Potomac is kind of a dump. I mean, these are, and, uh, you know, I know that, like, Potomac's media guy listens to this. He, I don't think he disagrees with me. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember going into the visitor's clubhouse in Lynchburg. I've, cha- I've had better visiting team facilities playing high school basketball in New Hampshire. Um, at the JV level, I'll, I'll add, than, some, than the facilities for the visiting team in Lynchburg for a 25-man team. It was unbelievable. Uh, so it, it's just – that said, I think the Major League Baseball talking to the affiliated minor leagues in this way, I think it's something of a poison pill. A lot of these affiliates can't afford to make these capital increases, uh, to make these capital improvements, sorry, to pay players – I don't understand why it's their problem. Major League teams have this money. It, they made they were a ten. Major League Baseball was a ten billion dollar industry last year. You can pay a living freaking wage to your minor league players, even if they're war guys. I'm sorry. And yes, this email is right. Michael is right. 
Major League teams can afford to do this. It would be a great bargaining chip when you're trying to sign guys. Hey, we pay a living wage. Um, but unfortunately, organizations are lockstep. Uh, and, I mean, the, the Major League Baseball is busy doing things like lobbying Congress to allow them to keep below living wage minor league wages. It's, it's incredible. I don't understand why. I mean, it, um, Melanie Newman, the new play-by-play uh, broadcaster in Salem, tweeted a picture from the first road trip for Salem. They stopped at Subway, which is a step above where they usually stop. I mean, usually they're stopping at McDonald's or Burger King. Um, it's still just – I don't understand why you're forcing these players doing an athletic profession to eat fast food on the road – to make ten grand a year work, I mean, even ten grand over six months. Yeah, get a job in the off season. By the way, you're upset when these guys come in out of shape because they had to work a job in the off season because they had a kid. Uh, it doesn't add up, and it, it infuriates me as I think it's coming through. Um, and and I, you know, I don't know how the Red Sox compare. We don't know publicly what teams pay their players. Um, well, I think there's a reason it's not publicly available. Well, no, that's exactly it. There's a reason yeah. it's not public. And there's a reason why the Blue Jays put out the press release that they're improving pay. Uh, and they put out the percentage that they're improving it by. I don't know that they put out the salaries. Um, no, you'll never get that on the you're record. You're never going to get that. And the problem is that this is collectively bargained by... Well, no, it, it's not, though. Well, but, but, but it's like... It, we, we, it would, yeah, it would be collectively bargained by the players union, which doesn't represent minor leaguers. Right, so they're and not represented by anyone. So, so that's, that's why always going to be a like trade. Th- yeah, that's always going to be a trade trip. They're okay with punting on. Yeah. Um, well, that's why you see whenever there's negotiations, anything to do with minor leaguers is immediately given away. Right. Because the major league players don't care about the minor leaguers because they're not league, immediate. Major league players care about having an extra seat on the bus in spring training. Exactly. So that's why anything to do with minor leaguers or the draft or the international market, they're more than willing to willing to negotiate with. Yeah, it's a tragedy of the commons type thing. Not exactly, but it's close. Um, and that's why you end up where we are. So thank you for the email. Well, and I will Matthew. say also – I called you addition, Michael, it's Matthew. Yeah, in addition to the Blue Jays, I know there are some teams that have their players on nutrition programs, for example. Now I believe the Brewers are one of them. Okay. So that's something that has been trying to improve. But we don't know how the Red Sox rank up against well, those did, other teams. Didn't they have a whole thing where they brought in like the lifestyle coach and then she had an employment action against them? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's what happened. But at any rate, um, yeah. So in the meantime, yeah, there's – could you <laughs> – anyway, yeah, there's Firefly the Cat. She's fired up about it too. But um, we here in the in the Hatfield household are pretty fired up about this. Um, hopefully it'll change. It's almost like you're a lawyer. And it's you almost know like I'm a lawyer. the laws should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But at any rate, all right, well, thank you all for listening. We're going to wrap it up. Thanks to Podcast Joe 2.0. Uh, for for uh, editing and producing the pro- the podcast, follow us on Twitter. Make sure you go to the site account at Sox Prospects. Follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I A N C U N D A L L. Follow me at S P Chris Hatfield. I will be back on there more now that I am not in the throes of trial prep and an actual trial. Um, thank you to Ian for coming on and not asking how the trial went. Thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll be back at you soon. We should be more regular as the season goes on, like we are taking Metamucil. Thank you, everyone. Uh, We'll be back at you soon. Again, patreon.com slash Sox Prospects as well. Thanks, everybody.